day one of the Harvest Conference 2019. Make some noise! Yes. Hallelujah. Are we excited? Are we ready for today? Yes. Great. We're just about to get into the Bible exposition. And the person that's coming to minister to us is a great, great gift here at DCIK and to the body of Jesus Christ. One of the best expositors I have ever listened to. And so I want us to put our hands together and celebrate the Lord Jesus as we invite Reverend Francis Omedo. Come on, celebrate! Hey! Amen. Lift up your hands above your head and give Jesus a mighty shout. Come on, give him a mighty shout of praise. Glory, glory, glory. Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Did you say hi to your, your neighbor? Do you know their name? Eh? Do you know their name? It's a little bit chilly this morning, so we have to stay together to keep each other warm. Amen. Did you appreciate the worship team for a wonderful job they did? Wow. That is powerful ministry. Thank you very much. Thank you for that good ministry. When I grow up. Eh? When I grow up. That was really powerful. Amen. The other guy is called Victor. This other guy is called Kimo. Yeah. Thank you very much, guys. Let me just allow you one boy to say hi to, to us. Amen. Good morning. Hi. Wow, it's good to see all of us this morning. What a privilege, what an honor to be seated under the feet of Jesus just to feast from his table. May the Lord bless you and do you good. Amen. Ah, if you want to clap, clap. Vanessa Sefiwe, we are doing the book of... Eh? Hey, did you carry your Bible and your notebook? Did you receive a notebook? And your Bi what about your Bible? You didn't come for a walk. You came to, to learn, right? And therefore, we are going to learn. The book of Ephesians is a very interesting book, and you're going to love it. Because what God reveals to us through that book is just awesome. Um, did we appreciate Pastor David Kibera? Pastor Dave! <laughs> eh? Yeah. That is the top smile in this compound. And we thank God for, for that. Amen. Here, here. His princess is not around, but she will be coming in shortly. And it was Esther Kibera. Queen Esther. See more appreciate. Okay, appreciate you wengine na wako PS kumoja. Ata. Appreciate you. See you in power. So I'm waiting for you to get your Bible and then your notebook. Did you get it? All right. And when you have your Bible, you open to the book of Ephesians. You know where Ephesians is? It's in the New Testament. Uh, after Galatians. Okay. Today, I um, just want to share with you what I'll be sharing uh, with you across the week. I want to give you a synopsis or a picture, a glimpse of what I'll be sharing just to lay out the outline 
and uh, really about the outline of the book of Ephesians because for you to understand the details of a book, you have to understand the general view of the book. It is very difficult for you to understand what a verse means in a book without you understanding what the whole book talks about. Why was the book written? To whom was the book written? And all those details are very critical for us to understand. Uh, if you read a verse in scripture, like Ephesians, you just open to the book of Ephesians 6.10 and they say, now be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. You may not really understand the context of that verse until you understand the general overview of the book. That's why most of us do not understand the nitty gritties of scripture because we have not labored to understand the general view of the book. You must understand the spirit of the book because every book was written for a reason. Remember the Bible is not a book. The Bible is a library. It's a library of books. books. And so every part and every section of that Bible was meant to address a certain thing. Now the book of Ephesians was written to a people called Ephesians. If you read Ephesians chapter 1 verse 1 it says Paul an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, according to the will of God unto the saints at Ephesus and to the faithful ones. You see uh, he's writing to the saints in at Ephesus and is an apostle of Jesus Christ according to the will of God, meaning that his apostleship is not by his own choice. He did not call himself an apostle. He was chosen according to the will of God to write to a people called uh, the church that was at Ephesus. Ephesus was a very cosmopolitan city. It was the busiest city of those days. It was a business center, but also it was a richly religious city because the Grecians or the Greeks and the Roman gods found their worship there because there are many gods that were worshipped at Ephesus. And that is why when you read the book of Ephesians, you are going to understand because you understand the people that Paul was writing to this letter. But you have to first of all ask yourself, who was Paul? Paul uh, was an apostle of Jesus Christ, but how did he come to be an apostle? Uh, Paul received his conversion in Acts chapter 9, isn't it? If you read Acts chapter 9, verse 1 and 2, you are going to see that Je Jehovah God, Paul was a persecutor of the church. He went about killing and persecuting and harassing the saints because he didn't believe uh, the message about Jesus Christ. But he was a strong and strong believer of the Judaism. So he defended the faith of Judaism. They didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. They believed that the Messiah was yet to come. So anybody who preached contrary message, Paul was one of those guys who went about uh, persecuting those people. He was a highly educated person because he learned under the feet of the most acclaimed uh, theologian of that time called Gamaliel. So he had a lot of knowledge. That's why you find him when he's talking about this word. He's able to engage the word. He's able to engage the word. He was able to engage the people at Athens, the synagogues and the theologians of that time. Uh, that, that means that when you are saved does not mean that your mind goes on break, isn't it? You can still be an intellectual Christian. You can engage the word, isn't it? That's why Jude says, uh, Jude chapter 1 verse 3 says uh, that you be able to contend for the faith. If you are able to contend for the faith that you have received, you don't just tell people, no, you won't understand. No, the, your peers must be able to understand the word from you because you are able to divide the word. Hallelujah. So Paul was a greatly, uh, greatly knowledgeable person. He's converted in Acts chapter 9, verse 1 and 2. But in Acts chapter 9, verse 25, he's able to receive the call of God upon his life. He's sent to the Gentiles. Remember, you are not called to reach everybody. There are specific kind of people that God has ordained you to reach. You are not the general manager of the world. Hmm? You are ordained to reach a certain 
group of people. So he was ordained, verse 25 and 6, he was ordained uh, Paul. Remember he was called Saul of Tarsus, but his name was later changed to Paul. Uh, so he was ordained uh, to reach the Gentiles. The message of the mystery of the gospel of God was committed to Paul to the Gentiles. Remember, Peter was called to reach the Jews. But Paul was committed to reach the Gentiles. He was given a specific message. That's why uh, Paul is the carrier of the message of grace. You can never understand grace until you read the Pauline epistles. Are you following I'm building a background so that you'll be able to understand once we get into the book, you'll be able to understand what we're talking about. So Paul, uh, the persecutor, is converted to be a carrier of the gospel to the Gentiles. Paul had visited Ephesus many, many times. If you read the book of Acts chapter 18, verse 19 to 21, he visits Ephesus shortly just to speak and to preach the gospel. If you read now the book of uh, Acts chapter 19 and verse uh, 1 to 10, talks about the journey of Paul to Ephesus. He, it is a place that he spends a lot of time, two years at Ephesus. And then you read the book of Acts chapter 20 and verse 17 to 38. He comes to Ephesus just to speak to the elders and to the leaders and to commission them. So that is a history about his interaction with the church at Ephesus. You'd notice that most of the letters that Paul writes, writes for to solve or to answer a certain question that has been raised by the churches. If you read Corinthians, for instance speaks about the issues at Corinth. If you read Galatians, it speaks at go, uh, issues at Galatea, the church at Galatea. But it, Ephesians is the, one of the books that Paul writes without answering any question, without necessarily responding to a problem that has occurred. That is why the book to the epistle of Paul to the Ephesians is a very rich book. It's a very rich book because it's not responding to a problem in the church. It's just addressing about the revelatory knowledge of God. So when you read uh, Acts chapter 20 and verse 17 to 38, you are going to see the story of Paul with the leaders at Ephesus. You'll also notice that this is the same church that God talks about. He says Ephesians were faithful people. He says, I know you. I know that you have rejected the false prophets and the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. If you read that Revelation chapter 2, verse 1 to 7, he talks about uh, the church at Ephesus. But he has one thing against them. Uh, Revelation chapter 2, verse 4, he says, but you have forsaken the first love. Do you remember? The first love. You have forsaken the first love. He says, so go back uh, to the first love. So that is Paul and that is uh, the Ephesians. The Ephesians, uh, remember it was not only written to the saints at Ephesus, but it says to all the faithful, all the faithful. Are you faithful? Huh? Are you faithful? So all the faithful, the people that have received the Lord as their personal Lord and Savior, they come to the Lord. And uh, if, if you want the general or one topic for the book of Ephesians talks about the riches, the riches of a believer. It talks about the riches of a believer. It is this book that is going to tell you how rich you are. Eh? How rich you are. Because you've never known what is inside of you until you read the book of uh, uh, Paul to the Ephesian church. Because it talks about riches. That you seated here are rich in yourself. And this week you are going to understand how rich you are. Glory to God. You are going to understand how rich you are. That by the time you leave this conference, you are going to understand that no, no one can despise and look down on you. Because God has placed a measurable deposit of wealth inside of you. So the book of Ephesians can be divided into two. It has six chapters divided into two. Chapter one to chapter three talks about your riches in God. Or what has happened inside of you. Then chapter 3 to 6 talks about now what you ought to do to the world. The effect of the word of God upon your life, chapter 1 to 3, the effect of your transformation to the world. If you want, what has God done for you inside of you, chapter 1 to 3, then what ought you to do to the world? We'll be talking about the walk, the Christian conduct. 
Now that this has happened inside of me, how am I to influence my world? Chapter 1 to chapter 3 talks about the riches of God deposited in me. And how chapter 3 to 6, 4 to 6 talks about how those riches in me are supposed to affect my community and the people that are around me. So that is uh, the division of that book. And you realize Paul takes time to build it slowly by slowly, slowly by slowly, just to get you to understand what God has done inside of me and what I as a person, now as a believer, I'm supposed to affect the community or the world in which I live. Amen. Can we now dive into the book? Paul, you'll notice that Paul, when the, by the time this is important to you, for you to note, that when Paul is writing this, he's in chains. He's under Roman uh, captivity. Yeah? If you read that, uh, Ephesians chapter 1, it says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus, in according to the will of God. He says, Paul, chapter 3, verse 1, he says he's a prisoner. Give us Ephesians 3, 1. Paul is a prisoner. Uh, he's not just writing that from a Hilton Hotel somewhere. And that's why you're going to understand when he talks his tone, his language, the way he's addressing you. Because when you're reading a letter from somebody in prison, you read it differently, isn't it? Let's read chapter 3, verse 1. What does it say? He says, for this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner for you. Now, would you imagine that well, you, are, you are reading a letter and somebody is telling you, I am in prison for your sake. Eh? Somebody has gone to prison for you. Can you read it differently? Eh? Do you read that letter differently? When somebody is in prison because of you. Give us 4 verse 1. 4 chapter 4 verse 1. 4 verse 1. Come and read, it says, I therefore, of the Lord beseech you to walk worthy. Yes, he says, I a prisoner, I beseech you to walk worthy of the calling. I a prisoner, I'm in prison for your sake. It is this gospel to the Gentiles that has taken me to prison. Now, I therefore, therefore means that he has been talking about something which we shall be looking at, isn't it? Give us chapter 6, verse 20. Chapter 6, verse 20. Chapter 6, verse 20. It says, For which I am in, that I may speak boldly as I ought to, that I am an ambassador in chains, that I am chained because of this word. So I speak to you as an ambassador in chains. Speak to you this word as an ambassador in chains. Uh, he is behind bars. The Romans have taken him captive, but he's able to think about the people that he has labored for. Says, I labor. He has been saying that I labor until Christ is formed in you. He's writing a love letter to these people, encouraging them, giving them revelation. And you notice that when these people are reading this, they're reading as a precious letter from a special friend that has labored on their behalf and is an ambassador in chains because of them. This was a church that he loved. You, you know that he has spent a lot of time in this, church, in this church. He has written during this time when he's writing the book, uh, the Pauline epistle to the, to the Ephesians is also writing the same, at the same time, if you read the books of Colossians, for example, Philippians and Philemon, you'll see the same language because they are written at the same time. So those are the books that were written at the same time as the book or the epistle to the Ephesians. How does the story flow? You'd notice that when he starts to write them, because uh, if you've ever written letters, during these generations, I don't think we write a lot of letters. We write short, short words, and we do not know how to express ourselves. But if you read the book of uh, the Pauline epistles to the uh, Ephesians, you see how he starts. He says, 
Paul, an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ according to the will of God, to the saints at Ephesus. He's writing to the saints. Who are the saints? Saints are separated ones. Saints are consecrated, put apart for a special mission. Uh, saints were people that were, were removed from others. You see, so when he's writing to you as a saint, he's not writing to a common fella. He's writing to people who are chosen, to those that are chosen, uh, to those that are set apart and consecrated. Uh, if you find in your house you have things that you have separated for a special purpose, there are utensils that you don't use for any other reason. You have set them apart. For, so they are consecrated for a special use. And so he's writing to you as a saint. Somebody who is separated and consecrated for a special use. He says to the faithful. Faithful that are scattered across Asia. Faithful meaning that they will be able to hold on to the faith. They are true to the call. Faithful are people who are not adulterers in their, you know, adultery is not just sexual. Adultery is also mind, isn't it? That once you're given, when you read the book of the, the Old Testament prophets, they're talking about an adulterous generation. That you, I, that, uh, that saved you out from Egypt, you have forsaken me and moved to other gods. So, that means that if you have forsaken the love of God and your faith in God, you are not faithful. Faithful to the call. Faithful to your life. He that paid a price. And First Peter chapter 1 verse 18 tells us about the price that he paid. He says that you are not bought of corruptible seed. The price of silver and gold. But you are bought of a precious price. The blood of Jesus Christ. So he that has purchased you means he owns you, isn't it? You are consecrated for his use. So he's writing to you the saints who are faithful to scattered across he says, now according, according to his divine power has given us. You see, God has blessed us. He says, you are blessed, verse 3. He says, he has blessed us with all riches, isn't it? In heavenly places. So that you are going to find out, once we continue reading this, you are going to see that you have blessings of the Father, blessings of the Son, and then blessings of the Holy Spirit. And we are going to... Uh, to break them as we continue. He says, uh, give us verse 3, verse 3, so that we read together. Verse 3, chapter 1, verse 3. Chapter 1, verse 3. Let's read this. He says, blessed and the Father who has with every... Now let me ask, with some of the spiritual blessings, eh? does it say some? Does it say most of? What does it say? Every. So we are going to break every. What does every mean? And then he's telling us about our position. That our position is not on earth. He says where are we? Heavenly places in Christ. We are seated somewhere else. And you're going to see that. And that's why when you see this now, you're going to understand chapter 6 when he talks about be strong in the Lord and the power of the might. That we are not wrestling against uh, or whatever, uh, flesh and blood, but we have principalities and powers. And you're going to see their position and your position in God. So you are blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. You see, the heavenly place where you are seated at, has everything that you ever need. So he tells them, my sons and my daughters, God has blessed you with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. So you must ask yourself, how do I get to the heavenly place? How do I get to a place where everything is in Christ with me? That's why Colossians 3, 3 talks about we are hidden with Christ in God. That's where we are seated. And now he says, verse 4, verse 4 says that we are, you are chosen in Christ before the foundations of the earth. Talks about that you, verse 4, chapter, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, he says, well, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, he says, read with me, he says, just as he chose us in him before the foundations of the earth, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. 
that you didn't choose him yesterday or the other day when you thought you were being saved. Christ, God chose you in Christ before the foundations of the earth. And you're going to see that he's going to tell us why. When you go to chapter 2, uh, verse 10, he says we are with his workmanship that was chosen before the foundation of time to show forth his glory. So you are chosen, he says you are chosen in God eh, before the foundations of the earth. That you, God is going to use you to show forth his glory. That now you are not alone. He continues to say that now because you are chosen in him before the foundation of the world, you are given a spirit called adoption. Isn't it? Adopted into the family of God. Now you are not an orphan. Now you cannot be rejected by, by men because you have been adopted by his spirit. That's what the Romans talk, talk about. Romans chapter 8 and verse 15, 16 talks about adoption into the sonship. So he says, he tells us from verse 6 that he, we are adopted. Verse 5 says, predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Are you seeing that? That God has predestined. To predestine means what? To destine before, isn't it? The word pre, if it appears before a word, it means before the word, isn't it? Hey, come on, guys. Anybody went to school? What does preschool mean? Before school, isn't it? Pre-university means what? Predestinate means what? Yes. Predestined means what? Before you destine, isn't it? Yeah. That before you start here and, uh, and attend a workshop about how to understand my purpose, how to understand my destiny, how to understand... Ah, God already planned for it <laughs> before you were born. Eh? So your answer is in God, isn't it? Once, once you get yourself in God, you understand where your destiny is. Pray. God did not bring you here and then start thinking, okay, now that she has arrived, she's blue, what can I do with her? Uh-uh. She first of all, he first of all laid everything you ought to do before you were created. And don't worry about how you came in. You see, God, God will surprise you. You came out of wedlock. Maybe you came, they were looking for a boy and you came out as a girl. Maybe they didn't like your color or you didn't. But that, those were just instruments God was using to bring you on the face of the earth. But God had already destined. Eh? <laughs> And the way, that is why I love, I love God. When he predestined means, he looks at your assignment and forms you according to your assignment. He says this assignment requires a tall girl. This assignment requires a very dark girl. Eh? This assignment requires somebody who is limping a little bit. This assignment. So you are not an accident. Predestined means that he laid out your purpose before you even came. So he didn't form you and then say, oh, now that she looks like this, what can I do with her? Uh -uh. No. She, first of all, he said, what do I want done? Then let me create someone who can fit into this purpose. Glory to God. So that is why he didn't make you very brown. <laughs> your purpose is not for brown people. Yes? Ah, he didn't give you very tiny eyes. He gives you very big eyes because your assignment requires big seeing. Yes, you need to see properly. Praise God. Your assignment may, may not require all the curves. Maybe your assignment is straight. You understand? <laughs> it has no purpose by, it has no significance of the means by which you came. Uh -uh. It has no significance by the means by which you came. Forget about what your parents are telling you and what your peers are telling you. The word of God has already laid it out for you. God who is your creator. Hmm? And by the way, let me tell you something. How many people here did biology? You know there are people who go to school but don't learn. Eh? They are doing or you are doing biology. 
There are people who go to school but don't learn. They just think that I'm writing exams to pass. Biology tells me that a human being has millions of sperm, uh, uh, sperms, isn't it? Right? And when sperms are released, they are in millions. True or true? Then there is a destination they are going. But only one will succeed. Hmm? So if you have three million sperms, only one is going to succeed. Huh? And your family, your family, by the way, you might only be two. Meaning, like 200 million sperms were involved. But only two came through. And one of those is you. So, you are so strong. And that is a marathon. Do you know the distance they cover? Do you know the distance they cover? Kilometers upon kilometers in their eyes. You understand? In their eyes is kilometers. They say, eh, these kilometers are so many. But who comes through? So when you come through my sister and my brother, let, let no one start talking to you about Siju your ears, Siju your feet, Siju your what, even to be here. Hey. It's a miracle. You are predestined before the foundation of the world, chosen to be adopted to the family of God before this universe came into being. Amen. So let no, nobody talk about your hair. Huh? Let nobody talk about your colors. You know, somebody said, he, somebody gets into my house and say, what colors are these? What are these? These are my colors. If you want your colors, you have your house. You understand? <laughs> Don't get into my business. I know I'm talking to an age where we are looking for identity, acceptance, whatever. If you read this verse, it's going to change your mind. You're going to go back to that university, that college, that school and tell people, boss, from today, I am done. There is no place I'm trying to fit because I, I was fitted before, before I came out. So I'm not trying to fit. If you don't like my nose, you have friend, other friends, isn't it? The school has 1,000 people. Hmm? Look around. <laughs> but I'm not going to try to fit. I am chosen before the foundations. So, Paul is right. Remember this guy is in prison. You understand? So when you're reading this verse, you know this guy knows something. So, it's you are chosen in God before the foundations of the world. You are adopted into his family. And now we have by his blood, he has bought you by his blood. He continues to say that by the remission of sins, now there is forgiveness of sins. Remission of blood, isn't it? By the shedding of blood, there is remission of what? Of sins. He has bought you by his Christ. He has predestined you. Romans, in fact, Romans 8, 29, he says those he called, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. It says those he called, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that you might be the firstborn among many brethren. That Jesus is the, <laughs> you know when you read firstborn, you think he's talking about somebody else. Jesus is our firstborn. Hey. And you know how firstborn is protective? Eh? <laughs> when that guy bullies you in school, say, I'm going to call my firstborn. Our firstborn in our family. Eh? When he comes, he's going to show them. That is our firstborn. He says he predestined you to be conformed. That means already by the time you were born, Christ already planned that you be shaped and conform, be conformed according to his image. So it is not something that you are going to try to do. You know, most of us have religion in our mindset. They think, I need to do this and this and this. And we come from a system of rules and regulation. The more wayward you are, the more rules are ready to you. Rules never change anyone. Rules cannot change somebody. You just become frustrated, isn't it? But Jesus has given you power that before you are formed, 
he predestined that you be conformed to the image of his son. It says, now that you are conformed to the image of his son, Paul now makes a letter. There are two prayers that he makes in this, in this book of Ephesians. One is found from chapter 1, verse 15. He says, since I heard of your faith in God and your love for the saints, I cease not to make mention of you in my prayers. That the God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, will give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. That your eyes being enlightened, verse 18, that you may know the hope of his calling and the riches of the glory of inheritance in the saints. And the exceeding great power to us as who believe, according to his mighty working power, that he wrote in Jesus when he raised him up from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above principalities and powers and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. Verse 22. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is the body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. That's the first prayer. We are going to find another prayer in the book of Ephesians chapter 3 from verse 1 to 23, but there is another part there, 14 to 23. We're going to look at the two prayers. Because another issue that we have, another challenge, uh, challenging area that we have is the area of prayer. And we are going to look at the example, the model of Paul when he prays for the saints. For, so this first prayer is the prayer of enlightenment. He's praying that your eyes will be opened. Praying that the eyes of the Ephesians might be opened. The other one is the prayer for enablement. He's praying that they'll be enabled to see the depth and the height of the love of God upon their hearts. So after he has done that, he says now, remember we are talking about chapter 1, and he has said that you are chosen in him before the foundation of the world, that you'll be adopted. That means that you'll be conformed, that you look like Christ. And that through you, he might show forth his glory upon the face of the earth. That he's going to use you to show how powerful he is to the earth, to the people around you. That he's going to use you as an instrument to show your friends how powerful he is. And then Paul now makes a prayer for them. He says that, I, I pray for you that your eyes may be opened. And you're going to look at that prayer next uh, as, as we continue with the lesson. Now, chapter 2 starts with, he talks about you. Now, look, you that were lost in your perversions, lewdness, and whatever else, your corruption, and lack of conscience. But God came, Jesus came, and bought you. That you are not among the people that were bought, uh, that were chosen from the beginning. But God has come and paid a price for you. You understand? What is called grace. Grace has given you what you do not deserve. Therefore, he says it's by grace. You know, now he has taken you and purchased you. And he has blessed you with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. And now he has lifted you together to be seated with him in heavenly places. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 6. He says he has lifted you. So your place is no longer in the circle of your friends or where you are born or where you come from. But Christ has lifted you so that you are seated with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Because he, all this has happened because of the grace. Because it is by grace, chapter 2 verse 8, it is by grace that you are saved. Eh? Through faith. And it is not of your own works. There is nothing that you can do to be saved. He has already paid the price for you to be saved. So you do not work on your, uh, to salvation. Get, there are two things scripture is talking about here. He says there is nothing you can do to be accepted, but you do things because you are already accepted. Ah, that's liberating. It means there is nothing I can do to be good. But I am good because God has already done everything. Praise God. So it's not the set of rules and regulations. Do not do this. Do not do this. Then I'll feel nice. No, I do those things. 
I am not saved by works, but I am saved unto good works. That now, there is nothing I do to be saved, but I do things because I'm already saved. Ah. The unconditional love of God means that there is nothing I will never do that I'll be rejected from sonship. <laughs> the way I talk, the way I relate, whatever I do, is not a condition for me to be called a son. I am a son no matter what I do. But now I am empowered to do good works because I understand my sonship. I am called, I am accepted, I am approved. Eh? <laughs> so I am not looking for approval from anyone. I am already approved. When you get that revelation, you will come out of religion. Because religion is going to look at you and assess you and say, uh -uh, you have not met the condition. Because there's things you need to do more. Do you know with religion, there's always something else you need to add. There's something else you need to do. Hmm? Okay, you've tried to sing very well. Uh, okay, sing harder. Hmm? You've tried to do this and this. Come early now. Yeah? <laughs> huh? Where is your gift? Give. Where is your what? Please, as a son. I'm already a son no matter what I do. But now I'm empowered as a son to do the things that I ought to do. Because God has already blessed me. That the, there is a sermon I preach here called the Sermon on the Mountain. It says, blessed are... You see, when Jesus came, he didn't tell you, now do this and this and this. He said, you are blessed first. You are blessed to obey the law. Eh? You don't obey the law so that you'll be blessed. But you are blessed to obey the law. You see, it is liberating if somebody wants to you to follow a path and then empowers you to follow it. But it's frustrating if you have 12 rules and then you don't have power to obey them. God does not just save you from sin. He also saves you from the power of sin. Huh? You know, most of us, with sin, we are like, eh? Because to kipatana ni tanguka tu. Some of you have not stolen, not because you are not a thief. It's just because the opportunity is not there. Because the power of sin is still in, inside of you. Yeah? And you're always afraid. How many people know that a lot of Christians are just afraid they may not make it. Eh? Ata hawa meka hapa. Naona hii kitu nita make kweli. Eh? Nani ya liniambia ni okoke? Hii kitu ni hard. And that's why when you preach to people, they tell you, eh, hey, Mr. Aki kuokoka alafu, unawana, nataka siku yenye nitakuwa serious. And I meet a lot of young people who are not so sure if by this time they close school, the, other the, the next time, they will still be in it. Eh? At least we may survive second term. Eh? <laughs> Unajua mtu anaitwa survivor. Ukisema we are survive bomb blast. Kuna watu wengine hata ana mikono tatu anaendanga hivi. Ni survivor yani? He came out but <laughs> he can't enjoy life anymore. He's wrong he, ilibaki. You are not survivor. God has never called somebody a survivor because you are victor. Victor means you came out whole. That you can enjoy life. You understand? Kuna watu walitokezea bomblas victims. Lakini, hata kusikia ski vizuri. Aesi enda mahali, can't drive a car, can't do anything. He says, guys, survivor, why the bomblas? You are not a survivor. Do you know God has seen your victory even before you get, you get it? Hmm? So he says, it is not by that God has paid the price for you to live a holy life. Holiness is not paid by you. It has already been paid. I say, hey, so I am righteous. No. Uh -uh. Get that theology out of you. The moment you were saved on that day, you were declared righteous. 
So you walk from a point of victory. Hmm? <laughs> he says, for we, having such a high priest, Hebrews chapter 4 and verse uh, 14, 15, says, having such a high priest, we do not lose hope. Says, for we do not have such a high priest that is not conversant with our affliction, but was tried in all ways, yet found without sin. Therefore, he says, he sympathizes with our affliction. He says, now, let us therefore, come and read this, he says, let us come to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help us in time of. How do you come? Come. The way some of you pray, does it look like boldness? Hmm? Sema God, kima mba ni mefanya iwiki, siju ni anzi ya wapi? Hmm? Does it look like boldy to you? But we're going to learn when we learn about prayer, you understand this. So he says you are chosen, chapter 2, you are chosen... Wow. I see my time is up. 